take a seat. If you have your Bible with you, turn with me to Matthew's Gospel as we continue in our series in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 17. And we're going to read from verses 14 through to the end of the chapter. Matthew chapter 17, beginning our reading at verse 14. And when they came to the crowd, a man came up to him and kneeling before him said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and he suffers terribly, for often he falls into the fire and often into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. And Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon. And it came out of him, and the boy was healed instantly. And the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? He said to them, Because of your little faith, for truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. As they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. And they were greatly distressed. When they came to Capernaum, the collectors of the two drama tax, drachma tax, went to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the tax? He said, yes. And when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first, saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take toll or tax? From their sons or from others? And when he said, from others, Jesus said to him, Then the sons are free. However, not to give offense to them, go to the sea and cast a hook, and take the first fish that comes up. And when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. I'm going to ask Michael if he'll come and share now with us. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for the warm welcome. A privilege to be uh, with you this morning, being able to minister from God's Word. If you have a Bible, please do keep it, keep it open. Uh, Matthew chapter 17, that will be really helpful for you as we go through these verses together. I wonder if you've ever had something that you would describe as a spiritual high point that perhaps may be your conversion. It's not always the case like th this, but for many people... At their conversion, they feel a joy and an inner peace, a wonder when they start to understand what Jesus has done for them. Or maybe you think to your baptismal service, perhaps you were baptized, and that occasion also as you stepped out in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ, it was a real high point in your Christian life. Or perhaps you were involved in some form of service, or you did something that put you out of your comfort zone, something you really had to seek the Lord for, rely upon the Lord for. And as you did that, it was accompanied with joy in the Lord as you were willing to step out in that way. Or maybe you can remember a real answer to prayer. One of those situations you didn't know where to turn. You were at your wit's end. You cried out to the Lord and the Lord was gracious to you, or maybe a service you were in where you could feel the presence of the Lord in a tangible sense, and it was just an amazing time. 
You felt buzzing. You had an unquenchable zeal following on from that. Maybe many experiences, <clears throat> excuse me, that you can think back to. But then, following on from that experience, maybe something happened. Perhaps it was a health problem. Or you came under some spiritual attack. Maybe you felt like the powers of hell assaulted your very soul. Maybe you were let down by a fellow Christian. That Christian may even have been a leader. Or maybe it was just simply the grind of everyday life. And that spiritual zeal and enthusiasm evaporated like the morning mist. You came back down to earth with a bump. Matthew's Gospel has five main teaching sections. They all end with the words something like, now when Jesus had finished these sayings. The last block of teaching prior to this section we're looking at this morning came in chapter 13. If you were to look at Matthew chapter 13 and see some of the things that Jesus taught, you would see some magnificent truths about the kingdom of heaven. This kingdom is inevitable and unstoppable. It will grow. Nothing can stop that. This kingdom is compared to hidden treasure or the finest of pearls. As Matthew records Jesus' teaching, it was a spiritual high point for all who were listening. Matthew records that the people were astonished at Jesus' teaching. Immediately before the passage that we read, we have another spiritual high point, I think, Maurice Kinnard went through this section with you. Jesus was transfigured before Peter, James, and John. Remarkable. They had the privilege of climbing a mountain with Jesus. And before their very eyes, Jesus changed. They were given a glimpse of the glory of the ascended, glorified Christ. Now, you could understand, surely, that Peter, James, and John were probably getting swept along with ever-increasing expectation of what the days ahead may hold. They perhaps had thoughts and imaginations of Jesus reigning from David's throne in Jerusalem, enemies vanquished. And of course... As Jesus' right-hand men, maybe they imagine themselves as his advisors or generals having significant, a significant place in Jesus' plans. I suspect they imagined that the kingdom would be something that they would see and they would have significant roles. And yet, what we see in Matthew chapter 17, verses 14 to the end of the chapter, is actually the reality of life in God's kingdom in the here and now. The disciples, especially Peter, James, and John, were going to come back down to earth with a bump. They're about to face health problems, spiritual attack, a distraught parent, unreasonable demands and suffering, things that we can all relate to, I'm sure. And yet one of the things that we're going to see in this section is even, those, even though these things appear to be spiritual lows, we actually find out that these things are Jesus' classroom to grow his disciples. Isn't that remarkable? These times of difficulty and trial are key times when the disciples are going to learn about faith and humility. If you've been a Christian any amount of time at all, you will know 
that Christian living and the path of discipleship is ordinarily not lived on the top of a mountain beholding God's glory. Instead, our lives are lived day in, day out, in the struggles and frustrations and disappointments of everyday life. With that being true, I'm sure these verses have much to say to us, and it's my prayer that we will glean much and the Lord will be our teacher. Two very simple points. Jesus commends faith. We see that in verses 14 to 23. And then Jesus models humility, verses 22 to 27. You'll notice that my um, sections span each other with those central verses 22 to 23 being in both points. So first, point one, Jesus commends faith, verses 14 to 23. Please do look down in your Bible just to follow as we just go through the text. Jesus returns down from the mountain and he meets a crowd and he's confronted by a distraught father. This man's son had seizures, what we would probably refer to as epilepsy, verse 15, but he was also, verse 19, in the clutches of evil. The evil spirit had a stranglehold on this boy's life, and he was set out to ruin him, verse 15. He was trying to kill him. The red-faced disciples have been unable to heal this man's son, and so the distraught father bypasses the representatives of Jesus and approaches Jesus himself to ask for some mercy. It appears that Jesus is a somewhat frustrated Messiah. We see that in the verse in verse 17. O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? I think we're supposed to see parallels between Jesus and Moses. So Moses came down from meeting God on the top of Mount Sinai to find the people of Israel being faithless and twisted in their thinking as they worshipped a golden calf. Here, Jesus returns from the mountain after hearing the voice of God, and he is met with faithful, faithlessness and twisted thinking. The distraught father comes to Jesus, and Jesus instantly does what the disciples couldn't do, and the boy is instantly healed. No delay, no problem. Where there was disease, there is now health. Where there was spiritual bondage, there is now freedom. Now this triggers somewhat of an inquiry. Why, the disciples want to know, couldn't we heal the boy? Jesus has already indicated the answer to that question, but in verse 20, he makes it crystal clear because of your little faith the disciples are faithless without faith it is impossible to please God faith takes God at his word it is to trust in God it is to depend on him it says because he says it I will believe it. It is a heart attitude that leans on Jesus. Back in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 1, we read these words. And he, that is Jesus, called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and affliction. These disciples in the past, had cast out demons and healed people. Why? How? Because Jesus gave them the authority. When uh, people are getting towards the end of their lives, one of the sad realities of life is, is old age, as you'll have seen in Ecclesiastes, or maybe it's tonight with Sydney, depending where you've got to. Old age is accompanied by lots of limitations and difficulties. 
to assist the elderly, often they give something called power of attorney to a family member or close friend who they trust. That is, so that family member or trusted person can act on their behalf, can withdraw money from the bank, can sell property and all other uh, legal transactions. They have that person's authority. And what we see here, Jesus, when he gave his disciples authority, the disciples are not doing that in their own power. It's the authority of Jesus over evil spirits. I'd like you to imagine back in Matthew chapter 10 what it must have been like for those disciples. They are told that they have been given Jesus' authority. So they leave Jesus, they go out on mission, and they're confronted by somebody who is possessed by evil. Now, they are no match to Satan and his offspring. They are powerless in the face of Satan and his offspring, but for the authority of Jesus. I can almost imagine them meeting someone for the first time and risking looking foolish by trusting Jesus. They utter some words rebuking the demon. And maybe to their surprise, maybe not, the demon obeys and their confidence in Jesus grows. But at some point, it appears that there's been a shift in their thinking. Because now in Matthew 17, they're confronted by a man whose son is possessed by evil and yet they can't do anything to help him. They are what the Bible describes as faithless. So there's been this shift in their thinking where they've gone from, we are taking Jesus at his word, we have his authority, to now being faithless. Maybe they thought, well, do you know what? We've cast out a few demons now. Jesus chose us to do that. He must think we're pretty special. And somehow it's gone from trusting in Jesus' authority and having faith in his word to acting in unbelief and perhaps in f- having faith in their own ability. Maybe having faith in the gift rather than the giver. Over time, something's changed. Now, the footnote in my Bible informs me that in some of manuscripts, not all of them, but some manuscripts contain these words, but this kind never came out except by prayer and fasting. Some people have that as verse, uh, some manuscripts have that as verse 21, following on from verse 20. What is prayer and fasting? Well, among other things, they are a concrete outworking of a heart of faith. Prayer and fasting are an outward, visible expression of inward, invisible dependence. The disciples, at some point, had an inward dependence on Jesus, but now it would seem there is, there is no dependence on Jesus, and so there is no external expression, which will be seen in prayer and on on occasion fasting. And so these disciples needed to learn afresh that they could achieve precisely nothing without faith. Where did they learn that lesson? The classroom for that lesson was called failure. Failure is a school of hard knocks. But in failure, generous, gracious Jesus is patient and kind and commends to his students faith. Look at verse 20, partway through. This is remarkable. Jesus' words, For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, You will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. What a commendation of faith that is. To move a mountain is a proverbial image for resolving a great problem. Jesus explains that with faith, impossible things become 
possible. Now, of course, the apostles had had first-hand experience of this. They'd received power of attorney, so to speak, to cast out de- demons. They'd seen impossible things happen through faith in Jesus, but it was something they needed to be reminded of. They would need to trust in Jesus' word. They would need to trust what he had to teach them. And they would need that all the more when we hear what Jesus had to say next. Verses 22 and 23. This takes faith. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him and he will be raised on the third day. Whatever expectations the apostles had regarding the establishing of the kingdom of God, I severely doubt it included Jesus being arrested and killed. Faith is required to see that Jesus' death would be victory. That the crown of thorns is a victor's crown. Faith would be needed to see that the cross that Jesus was nailed to was actually his throne where he ruled from when he defeated principalities and powers. Faith would be required to see that Jesus' splendor is seen in the very act of suffering. That that is where his glory would be most fully seen. Now let's apply some of these lessons from the king to ourselves. There are so many threads that we could follow, but for the sake of time, we'll pick just one major thread. I think one of the main things that we need to believe and take to heart is that Jesus commends faith to us because life in the kingdom is hard. Life in the kingdom of Jesus is a life of faith because it is hard. This glorious kingdom that Jesus taught about, this kingdom that will expand and will grow, requires confidence and dependence on him as we wait for his return. When Jesus spoke these words to his disciples... They would have to go through Good Friday, Saturday, and then Easter Sunday until Resurrection Day happened. In fact, it wouldn't be till Pentecost did they fully start putting all the jigsaw pieces of the gospel together. Now, we can look back on Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension as historical, factual events. Of course, we weren't there, so it still takes faith to believe them. But the return of Jesus is something that is yet to happen. We await that day. We expect that day. We long for the day when the kingdom will be consummated and the king returns. And as we wait, we need to exercise faith and trust in Jesus. Because our lives in the here and now will involve sickness frustration, temptation, spiritual assault, disappointment, uncertainty, and failure, exactly as we see in this passage. Every single day, each and every one of us will face the pressure of relying on self rather than taking God at his word and trusting in him and so Jesus wants each and every one of us to take this passage to heart and be people of faith who see impossible things happening please note this isn't about the quality of our faith that would be a big mistake Jesus makes it very clear that faith like a grain of mustard seed can move mountains. There is a very real danger that we turn our confidence away from Jesus to the quality of our faith. That is a very real danger. Recently, Glenn Scrivener uh, wrote an article called Faith is Not a Thing. 
And um, he, it's a much longer article than I'm going to quote, but this, this was part of what he wrote. He talked about dutiful Derek. And Derek's father said to him, we're going on holiday to Switzerland, and as we watch the sunrise over the snow-capped Alps, we will be awestruck. Dutiful Derek says, do I have to be awestruck? The father says, what an odd question. It's not so much a case of have to, but when you see the view, you will be awestruck. Derek sighs deeply and says, well, if I must. Later, Derek encounters an an evangelist who says, I will proclaim the glory of Jesus and you will put your faith in him. Dutiful Derek says, do I have to put my faith in Jesus? And once more, the response to Derek is the same. Yes, Derek absolutely does have to put his faith in Jesus. But what kind of have to are we talking about? It's the have to that arises from a heart captured by glory. The gospel primarily is not about our faith. Primarily, it's about the object of that faith. And that person is the beautiful saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. If we make the quality and size of our faith and dependence on Jesus the object of our salvation and our security, then we will be up and down like the changing of the weather and how we're feeling on any particular day. When the road is steep, when the path is bumpy, and we feel like we're clinging on by the skin of our teeth, If we're putting all our confidence in our faith, then that is a path to disaster and no assurance at all. But when we remember that Jesus is a complete saviour, when we remember that he is the one who will bring us safe home, that he will keep us amidst the storms and the trial, when our hope is there on Jesus then no matter how tough things are, we will have that peace and joy that comes from knowing him. And so with faith, we should expect mountains to move. Now, what Jesus doesn't mean by that is this nonsense that some false preachers teach, and that is, if you have enough faith, then everyone will get better and no one will be sick. That is not the teaching of the Bible. The special authority <clears throat> that we read about in Matthew's Gospel for the apostles as Jesus' representatives to cast out demons, I think was specifically for them as those first eyewitnesses to authenticate their ministry and to establish the church and for the writing of the Bible. That must be the key impossible thing that Jesus is speaking about. The establishing of his kingdom. Who would have thought these uneducated men would turn the world upside down? They saw impossible things happen as they depended on him and saw him working through them. And we today, as followers of Christ... We have to depend on him when living in the valley, learning to depend on Christ, awaiting his coming, trusting that he can do far more than we can ever think and imagine in saving people and in sanctifying people. As we approach this Christmas time, are you expecting God to change people with the good news of the gospel? As we afresh remember the birth of Christ, are you expecting people to come to a carol service to hear the gospel and for God to change their lives? Do you have faith that God can do that? Now, there are two concrete outworkings that we can know if we have faith that God can do that. We saw them in the footnote. They are prayer and fasting. The disciples had moved from faith to faithlessness, and they no longer depended on Christ. 
Now, it's easy for us, part of established churches, to subconsciously think we've done the whole running Christmas programs thing umpteen times before. We've got this. We've got the latest Life magazine from 10 of those, which is amazing. We, the graphics have got this. The wonderful meal on the 26th of, of December. We've done that. We've got this. Maybe the big lesson we need to learn today is not, not to do those things, but to learn afresh that we can achieve precisely nothing without faith. And the measure we believe that, the, the measure of our dependence on the Lord Jesus as we run things and, and pluck up the courage to speak to our work colleague about Jesus will be gauged by the amount of time that we spend on our knees in prayer and fasting. They are tangible, concrete outworkings of a heart that trusts in Jesus. Shorter second point, Jesus models humility, verses 22 to 27. Matthew, the ex-tax collector, pays particular attention to a question about tax. Uh, someone came up uh, to Peter and had a question about whether or not Jesus paid the temple tax. The temple tax was used for the upkeep of the temple. Official rabbis were exempt from paying the tax. Jesus was not an official rabbi. So let's jump into the discussion that Jesus now has with Peter reflecting on that question. So just part way through verse 25. What do you think, Simon? From whom do kings of the earth take toll or tax? From their sons or from others? And when he said from others, Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. However, not to give offence to them, go to the sea and cast a hook and take the first fish that comes up. And when, it's, and when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. This is a remarkable little section in Matthew's gospel. We're not going to spend too long on it. The temple is the temple of the living God. Now, of course, Jesus is the true temple. The temple is pointing to Jesus. Because the temple is a place where people meet with God. And of course, you meet with God in the, in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the word that became flesh. Jesus is not simply a rabbi. He's the living God. There is no obligation for him to pay temple tax for the upkeep of the temple. But what does Jesus do? Jesus humbles himself so as not to cause offence to somebody else and he's willing to pay a tax he doesn't even owe. But there's more. He isn't just willing to pay a tax he doesn't owe, he's also willing to pay someone else's tax as well. He also covers Peter's bill. <coughs> Amazing. The miraculous catch, a fish with money in its mouth, I think, serves to underline the authority and identity of Jesus. Creation bows to his mastery. Yet the one who the wind and waves listen to, the one who the fish obey, is willing to pay a tax so as not to cause offence to his creatures. What humility. Jesus paying a debt. He doesn't owe. Uh, but isn't that Jesus' speciality? Verses 22 and 23 again. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. That is Jesus paying a debt he did not owe. Your debt and my debt for our sin. Jesus models humility by humbling himself and paying tax, but by humbling himself to death, even death on a cross. Let's learn some lessons from the king. Our saviour and substitute commends faith to us, but he also models humility. Humility begins for us by looking to the man of sorrows on the cross. Behold your God, Shortly we'll sing, Behold 
our God. Let me read you the first couple of verses. Who has held the oceans in his hands? Who has numbered every grain of sand? Kings and nations tremble at his voice. All creation rises to rejoice. Who has given counsel to the Lord? Who can question any of his words? Who can teach the one who knows all things? Who can fathom all his wondrous deeds? Are you getting this vision of Jesus? Are you seeing his glory? His power? His authority? His wisdom? His strength? His knowledge? Where do, we, where do we really see his glory? Why will we praise him for all eternity? Verse 3, who has felt the nails upon his hands, bearing all the guilt of sinful man, God eternal, humbled to the grave, Jesus Savior, risen now to reign. The only reason you and I have a relationship with God is because Jesus paid a debt he didn't owe. Your debt. A debt you can never repay. The cross shows us just how much God loves us, but also just how serious our sin is. That should humble us. That should enable us, empowered by the Spirit, to follow in the footsteps of Christ and walk humbly before him as part of his kingdom. As we close, trust in Jesus. He commends faith in him to us. Walk in humility. They are the lessons from the king. As we approach Christmas, maybe we want some spiritual high points this year. Time amazed at the birth of Christ. Maybe time with family, maybe opportunities to serve. But recognize this December might be filled with frustration, knockbacks, difficulties and problems. But in those frustrations, we can walk by faith, confident that he will do immeasurably more than we can ever think or imagine in our lives. He will empower us to walk in humility as we follow in the footsteps of our Saviour, Jesus. Let's bow our heads together and just for a moment reflect on maybe something that the Holy Spirit has been prompting you in your own heart and life. Maybe there's some action that you need to take off the back of what you've heard. Why not, before the Lord resolve to do that, then I'll close in prayer before I hand back to Steve.